so thank you all very much for joining this uh, this last um, uh, Pushkin House Cosmos Reverse Perspective event. Um, it's been it's been a great six weeks. Um, actually, I've, I've been I, I think it's been one of the best things I've done while here uh, at Pushkin House. I'm really really pleased with with all the talks and works of art that we've seen. It's been um, a real pleasure for me, and um, we're delighted to welcome back the artists. Um, Gleb Sobolev and Liz Davis, I know, are on the call, but we should also thank, uh, of course, Marina Sokolova and Fred Scott for their work, and uh, Pierre Davoin and Anna Gorska as well for their, their help curating the exhibition. Um, tonight's discussion will be mostly, we've mostly filmed it in advance, um, so uh, please just remain muted um, throughout, but keep asking your questions through the chat. And we have got all of the participants here and they should be able to answer them at the end, um, which, which should be uh, an extra great discussion. Um, and, and we've got a couple of extra videos that I didn't advertise, but, um, but uh, are, are a real treat for us. Um, so, we have with us tonight Tim Ingold, uh, a British anthropologist and chair of social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen, and he's joining us from Aberdeen. Um, Yehuda Safran, who is a professor of uh, history and theory of architecture um, at Pratt Institute in New York, joining us from New York. And Vadim Mirabikov, um, who is an artist and a psychologist, um, and he's joining us, I think, from Russia. Um, and you'll you'll see them and Cleob and a little bit of myself um, speaking in, in just a second. Um, but now I will share with you this video that we've got from um, Larisa Babanova, who I think we have joining us today as well, um, who, who speaks about um, the, um, the significance of the hometown of Nikolai Fyodorov, who is one of the uh, main cosmist philosophers whose work um, we're all sort of indebted to in this exhibition. Um, and I think after that, it'll run straight into the discussion um, with uh, Tim, Yehuda and, and Vadim. And then it'll be uh, Alex Sokolov, who uh, will speak about the Soviet missions to Venus, because today is the 50th anniversary of the first time Venus was passed by a um, any man-made object, and it was a Soviet probe. But the Soviets did go back with further probes, which um, managed to photograph the sort of surface of Venus. So we'll have a chance to sort of see some of those pictures then. Um, uh, please, yep, do put questions in the chat, and uh, please stay muted while uh, while the, the, the video is going on. But uh, after that, we can unmute and ask some questions, I think. Um, and thank you all again, actually, all of our guests, because um, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't do it without you, really. Uh, over the last six weeks, it's been been great. Um, so I, I don't want to sort of talk for too much longer, so I'll, um, I'll hand over to these uh, videos. Um, Родина философа Николая Федорова – это село с поэтическим названием Ключи Сасовского района Рязанской области. Для нас, местных жителей, это название символизирует не только воду, дающую жизнь, но и инструмент, ключ, открывающий тайны Вселенной. Ключ к Вселенной дает рожденный здесь философ Николай Федорович Федоров, поставивший перед человечеством задачу найти способ регулировать природный, истребляющий ход существования, хаос и пожирание превратить в жизнь со всеми и для всех. Предки Николая Федорова, прожившего здесь первые годы жизни, лежат в этой земле, как и наши предки. Наши корни переплетены, как переплетены корни дубов, растущих на поляне, где некогда стояла усадьба князя Павла Ивановича Гагарина, в имени которого и рос будущий философ. В 
Все мы братья по любви к отцам, скажет позже Николай Федорович. И это умиротворяющее родство мы ощущаем, когда ходим по Федоровским местам. Останавливаемся на удивительно светлом Ключевском кладбище и скользим взглядом ввысь по стволам к верхушкам вековых сосен. Рядом часовня, на которой трогательная табличка. На этой земле родился и возрастал философ Федоров. Местный житель Александр Матвеевич Воробьев строил эту часовню в память своих родителей, своими руками воплощая Федоровскую идею сохранения памяти о предках. Многие местные жители именно из этой информации на часовне узнают о рождении в ключах известного философа. Сохраняет память о Федорове и храм в селе Вялся, восстанавливаемый по образу того, в котором крестили здесь новорожденного Николая, не получившего фамилию Гагарин по причине неузаконенного брака его родителей. Строительство на себя взяла дружная семья Каратаевых, и новый храм уже возносится в небо. Это многообещающее небо, Маниты курсантов Сасовского летного училища гражданской авиации, расположенного неподалеку. С борта самолета этого училища снимались кадры для фильма о Николае Федорове «Восьмой день творения» или «Русский космизм», напоминая о словах философа. «Ширь русской земли способствует образованию богатырских характеров. Наш простор служит переходом к простору небесного пространства» этого нового поприща для великого подвига. В год 60-летия открытия космической эры человечества Краеведческий центр имени Николая Федорова Сасовской центральной библиотеки вновь обращается к наследию Николая Федоровича, урожденного Гагарина, заложившего в основании философии русского космизма свой фундаментальный камень. Надеемся, что из наших юных читателей вырастут богатыри, которые будут дальше осваивать Вселенную, беречь и сохранять этот большой мир. Анна Горская of Федоров, Николай Федоров Library. She is a co-curator of, of most of the events and of the exhibition. Uh, Yehuda uh, Safran, uh, professor of Pratt University and uh, art critic and artist himself. Uh, Vadim... Professor of University of Aberdeen, anthropologist Timothy Ingold. And myself, Gleb Sobolev, architect and uh, also curator and participant of the exhibition. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And um, glad to see you. My first question is to Tim. I thought that uh, your text about anthropology is, is uh, something that is uh, very much linked uh, with our uh, with our with with our exhibition and events. An anthropology that has been liberated from ethnography, however, would no longer be tied down by a retrospective commitment to descriptive fidelity. On the contrary, it would be free to bring ways of knowing and feeling shaped through transformational engagements with people from around the world, both within and beyond the settings of fieldwork, to the essentially prospective task of helping to find a way into a future common to all of us. When we go to study with great scholars in the course of our education, we do not uh, we do so not with a view to describing or representing their ideas in later life, but to sharpening our perceptual, moral, and intellectual faculties for the critical tasks that lie ahead. Why, I wonder, should it be any different from anthropologists when they go to work with other people? The truth is that in finding ways to carry on, we need all the help we can get, but no one no indigenous group, no specialist science, 
Now, doctrine or philosophy already holds the key to the future, if only we could find it. We have to make the future for ourselves. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this is maybe describing one of the main aims of the whole uh, events of the exhibition that uh, we kept in mind when organizing it. And you as an anthropologist study landscapes, and or maybe I'm not correctly describing it, and people interacting with the landscapes and how people use and make objects and how this man-made world is created. And, uh, and you have introduced this uh, term or description uh, of cor co correspondence as a description of the method of anthropology, correspondence between events, uh, meanings, feelings, um, to, and uh, reality, or whatever we mean by that word. And uh, uh, Yehuda, as artist, theorist, and critic, uh, and historian of architecture and art, most of his writings, they um, about um, architects and artists, uh, is using their personal uh, history, personal biography, and links it to to the things they create. Uh, and uh, the title of the exhibition is "Cosmos: The Reverse Perspective." And um, it comes from the reverse perspective that was used in, in Russian icons. And geometrically, it is built as a projection of the sphere onto the point in the middle. And, and the projection plane is between this point and the sphere. And this is the icon which we see. Uh, so this is a completely different um, view than the one point perspective which is used in the the idea was to to join you uh, the geographer the um, art historian critic and artist Yehuda and you as an anthropologist who makes links and uh, tries to understand how people see uh, the world and understand it he, and to discuss what this new cosmic scale of looking at our planet gives us or maybe it's it, it doesn't give us something new here, but takes something away that we uh, stop to see something here. But we start to look at the stars, not, not at what is happening around us. Because yeah, I, I, I was thinking of three things. And the, the first was in, in response to your uh, questions about, about people's uh, changes in people's imaginations of the world and um, how new artificial gardens, built environments, how they change perception and what kind of effect it has that we, we can combine our own views of the world around us with these images from space. That was a set of questions that you asked. Yeah, and, yeah. And, um, and reflecting on those, I, I, I was thinking of well, something else I've written recently, which I think um, relates to this. Um, I've written a lot about um, a particular painting which I love, um, uh, Peter Bruegel's painting, The Harvesters. Uh, I have it on my wall now. Is this one? Yeah. Yes. Certainly we know it, yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I've written, I wrote an essay about that a long time ago. It wasn't actually about the painting, but I was imagining that I was inside the world that Bruegel was um, depicting. And, and, and I tried to write about how the landscape would appear from the point of view of one of the farmers working in that field harvesting the crop and and the argument was about the temporality of the landscape about how there are all kinds of different interlocking rhythms of time that are going on in the tree and the human work and the sea and and everything and how these how these interlocked with one another and therefore how we had to understand the landscape as a temporal process that we are part of and then i was reflecting back on that because this was written it's actually in 1993, and it was, and people were not much yet talking about the climate emergency, or, um, or about the crisis of neoliberalism, or about pandemics, or anything like that. Uh, and and now looking back at it today, I was, I, I, I no longer feel reassured by Bruegel's painting. Um, I feel anxious, and 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 what I sense, and I think many people sense, is a kind of contradiction that on the one hand, because of the overload, the superfluity of media representations and information, 
Um, I feel that, that when I look around at the world, at a garden or a forest or a woodland, it just holds no fascination for me anymore. It could just be another image that I get from the internet. You know, we see so many internet images that instead when you walk into a forest or into a garden, instead of being overwhelmed by the beauty of it all uh, and wanting to investigate and find out everything that's there, you say, oh yes, this is very nice. It's another picture. I've seen so many pictures. So that's, that's the one side of it, that, that one is no longer astonished by the beauty of these things. The other side of it is that, well, yes, it is astonishing because you see a world out there, but it's very disturbing because you realize that it's a world that has no concern for humans, whatever. So on the one hand, we're not astonished by what we see, but we place ourselves at the center of it. On the other hand, we are astonished, but we see a world that seems to have no place for us at all. And that, that, that I think is a, I think a lot of people, uh, myself included, are, are, are sensing the anxiety of, of that moment in which we, 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 we find it very difficult to relate in a meaningful way uh, to the world around us. Uh, either it's reduced to just another image or it's completely alien and seems to be full of beings that don't pay any attention to us <laughs> and we don't know what to do with it. So that, that, was, that was one thing that struck me in relation to, to, to that. Um, there were a couple of other points I wanted to mention. Um, one is about, this is also something I've written a, a long time ago, uh, when you're talking about the, the spire and the dome, or, or let's say the tree and the dome, um, it, it always seemed to me that, that the image of the globe uh, and the image of the tree, both of which are very prominent in Western, the Western iconographic history are mutually implicated. Um, that, uh, and, and we can see that today when we, when we compare the way biologists talk about biodiversity as this huge phylogenetic tree, uh, all derived from common descent from an ancestor, and the way they talk about the globe as um, the place that has been colonized by life. I think, I think the two um, actually entail one another. So it's not at all surprising that you find you know, in the biblical tradition, for example, images of trees and images of globes, and they both uh, appear um, together. So that, that, that was one thing. Um, but the other thing was that, I, again, I, I wrote a long time ago uh, an article comparing the globe and the sphere as ways of representing the earth. The medieval idea was a sphere. M more modern idea is the idea of a solid globe, and, and which is reinforced, of course, by images of the earth from outer space. And the thing about the globe is that it puts people all around on the outside of the world. In the, in the medieval spherical conception, it was originally um, anthropocentric, the human, um, I mean, rather than heliocentric, the, the human was uh, right in the middle. And then there are all these different layers of spheres. So you could, to perceive the world, you would stand where you are and look, penetrate, you could go further and further, uh, listen to the music of the spheres from, from, from the inside. But part of this transition to modernity was a sort of turning the relationship between people and the world inside out. So that the scientific, scientifically correct view is of a solid globe with people all around on the outside. Because that's a colonial view. That's a view that treats the surface of the earth as a space for life to colonize. And that's why people think nowadays, well, when the, if the earth's full up, uh, we'll have to go off and colonize um, uh, the moon or, or Mars or something like that. It's a, it's a product of that same inversion of, of turning the relationship between the people and the world inside out. Uh, and just to finish, uh, there was this wonderful study many years ago conducted by um, developmental psychologists who wanted to study how children drew the earth. Children were asked to draw a picture of the earth and then put some people on it. And some drew the, the earth as sort of a flat line, and it's just like the ground, and then they put their people on the ground. But other people drew the earth as a globe and then put people 
<laughs> stuck around on the outside surface. And, and then according to these researchers, who weren't very critical, they said, you see, those children who drew the earth as a globe with the people stuck all around, they had the correct view. That is the one that is scientifically correct, rather than the illusory view that we are all standing on a flat earth, which of course is the, um, the view, the, the, what, what we do actually perceive um, quite correctly in our everyday life. So it's the same, the same thing cropping up there, this the same inversion. So those, those are the things that I came to think of in, in response to your, to your question. Yehuda, maybe you can join. Well, I, I, I like to listen to him uh, and his description. Uh, very good and very pertinent. I think that uh, obviously every society project its own view of itself onto the world and see the world in terms which arises from its own internal relationship. It's no more, no less than a projection. And when it comes to the individual, likewise, I very much uh, believe in uh, the idea of uh, personal knowledge in the sense that uh, people think very often of knowledge in a kind of uh, objective, in inverted comma, terms. But in reality, uh, uh, knowledge itself is constituted ultimately by what we call personal knowledge. And there was one Hungarian philosopher uh, who actually developed it as a, as a thesis in a, a book called Personal Knowledge. So I think that ultimately what we call knowledge is inseparable from our experience of ourselves in a uh, given framework. And of course, in this respect, uh, there are many repetition. I mean, the idea of the cosmos as it developed in uh, Russian intellectual circles in the late 19th century had a many precedents, perhaps not with the idea of uh, insurrection and uh, <laughs> uh, which is closely related to a Christian idea, but certainly Serrano um, de Bergerac already in his time imagined uh, visiting the moon and other celestial places. So the dream is, as it were, not new. It's a dream that uh, uh, characterized uh, life on Earth ever since, uh, ever since. And I think that what we see in our own time is no more, no less than uh, uh, permutations of something that has been uh, hatching over many, many centuries, I think that. Uh, there is no doubt that it is a kind of a repeat, uh, a repeat, um, um, a repeat performance, if you like, and uh, and it has echo on many levels. I was thinking this morning as I was just walking around the house, I was thinking of. Uh, something that is not directly related and yet has an echo of it uh, in Mendelstam's uh, great uh, piece of prose called uh, 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 in English it's called the music of the world and in Russian it's uh, called probably uh, musica mira you know the, yeah. the sound of the world and when you read this uh, sound of the world, the Musica Mira, because in Russian, rightly, I think, like in ancient Greek, music, music, music is not just instrument playing. Music is all the kind of sound. And let us bring us again in another way back to our main subject, because the idea that mentioned already by Tim, the idea of the 
harmony of the world. Where does this come from? These Christians and classical idea of the world harmony, which is in German called Stimmung. You know, Stimmung is a funny word in German because it, uh, not, no, it is both at the same time, the atmosphere when you go for an evening with friends and you come home and your wife, girlfriend or mother ask you, how was the Stimmung in that evening? And you say, well, it was like this or like that. That's another kind of everyday meaning of Stimmung. But Stimmung in another level is exactly what we call in English, the harmony of the world. So where did this idea come from? Where, this is, where, this, where was, it, was it born? Well, by and large, we tend to think that it was born with Pythagoras. Why Pythagoras? Because Pythagoras was the first, shall we say, what? Mathematician, uh, a man of um, intellectual uh, formidable powers who uh, discovered that the proportion that dominant uh, creating different sounds on the octave and so on is precisely divided just like any measure that we normally apply to. So if the measures of everything else are, correspond with the measure that produces different tones, you get the idea of the harmony of the world. And this idea, uh, was very dominant, we would say, until the time of Newton. And the great English poet uh, Dryden actually wrote a poem in which he derides, as it were, Newton for destroying this harmony of the world. Huh? Because once he gave his interpretation to the celestial movement, etc., et there was, in a way, no longer uh, it was no longer possible to entertain this idea of the music of the world. And this uh, Dryden put at the feet of Newton, holding him responsible for depriving us. Nevertheless, I would say, the idea of the harmony of the world, of course, had to be renegotiated, I would say. And while we lost it as a totality, we, in different measures, we try to regain it again and again. One of the late work of Karl Heinz, Karl, uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen is called precisely Stimmung. And uh, Stimmung of Karl Heinz Stockhausen is a very ambitious, very large piece. I think it takes something like two hours. And it contains quotes and references to almost every uh, sound body that we, we are aware of. Whether it's the Indonesian gamelan, or whether it is uh, Japanese or Chinese or Indian, it is included in, in uh, Mr. Uh, Stockhausen Stimmung. I uh, highly recommend it to you, but bear in mind that you have to free yourself for a number of hours uh, in order to listen to it from A to Z. So how is it possible? I think it is possible for a number of reasons. Most people are not even aware that while Yes, Newton gave us the mathematics with which we could calculate uh, gravity, etc. He did not solve the main problem, which is still with us. What is gravity? Actually, nobody knows ultimately what gravity is. We do know that there is a force, but what is puzzling to our mind is that there is this force which we cannot as it were, spell it out. We don't know what is this force in reality, meaning that we know how to calculate it, we know how to measure it, we know all sorts of things. But what it is, as such, we do not know how things exercise this power from a distance. 
And here I come to another term that we are using again and again, which is so highly problematic and so characteristic of the human condition, which is, which is the word distance itself. Because uh, normally people consider distance as something that can be measured and can be known in a number of different ways. Yes, I would say, but what is distance? Distance is a human invention. And as all human invention, different people, as anthropologists will tell us, have different ideas of what distance consists of. But it, whatever it is, in whatever culture, in whatever times, it is always has one thing in common, which is that it is a human invention. There is no distance. Let us say, from God's point of view, there is no distance. Everything is as close to everything else as it is. And the distance is precisely one of our capacity as human being is to introduce, just like time. What is time? Nobody knows. Of course, there are time that we measure and time that we conceptualize in this way and in that way. But ultimately, it's our own invention. So I would say that in the main features of the world that we project around, the main feature of that world is a human invention, human invention, human invention. And this is why even the most enlightened person quite often you find in the back of his mind, there is a certain kind of religious preoccupation. I mean, look at Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky, uh, who used, by the way, these Bruegel paintings, right? Uh, Hunter, again, Hunters again. on the Snow. Yeah. Eh? Hunters on the Snow, December. Yes. He used, he, used, yeah. he used them again and again, not in one firm, but in yeah. several of his uh, firms. Uh, there are paintings of uh, Bruegel. Uh, sometimes they fill the entire the entire screen, and you really uh, it helps to disassociate yourself from a given time and place. And yes, there is this uh, insight in Bruegel. For me, the most significant Bruegel painting is not the Tower of Babel; it's rather the painting in which. It's called the Fall of Icarus. And if you remember this painting, which is in, I think, in Brussels, uh, you know, Icarus is a tiny speck falling into the water in the background, just after the, the, the sun melt his, uh, the wax that connected his wings to his body, he fell into the water. He did not obey his father warning to keep away from the sun. He was so excited. And then in the Bruegel paintings, you see in the background the fall of Icarus. But in the foreground, there's the same peasant that you saw in that other painting that Tim just shown us. The peasant who plows the ground, continue to plow as if nothing very important happened. And the large uh, sea going boats in the middle ground continue to be pushed by the same you know the wind that the same sun created is the wind that pushes this sail of these boats forward while uh, Icarus is uh, being uh, drawn into the into the water and indeed the painting is so powerful in this way that uh, two great uh, poets of the 20th century, one was Odin, and the other was uh, uh, um, the American uh, poet, uh, Carlo Williams, Williams, Carlos Williams, wrote poems about the fall of Icarus as in Bruegel painting. And the reason is obvious. We are deeply moved by this uh, painting Precisely that it touches on this uh, unfathomable, fathomable connection, mystery of uh, how things are held together. And so, if I have to conclude, 
uh, what I have to say, then I would say that the most important thing to appreciate is that the basic precepts that allow us to have any idea of ourselves or of the world emerge out of our own self-perception, which is so critical because it makes everything possible. And I will finish in my conclusion with one example from relatively recent history, which is the mathematics that developed out of the set theory. You see, when the set theory was more or less invented by uh, uh, Canto, George Canto, Canto was actually was descended of Portuguese Jews. But by the time he was born, his family was from all places in Russia, in St. Petersburg. They saw themselves as German Protestant in St. Petersburg. And so invented two memorable, incredibly important things. One is the equation of the infinity, you know, Aleph, zero plus Aleph equal Aleph zero and set theory. And the mathematician at the time, the greatest mathematician around him rejected him completely. And they said to him something very wise. They said to him, you should have waited with this paper at least 150 years, then it would be received better. And he was so desperate that he went to the Pope in Rome to ask for protection, to ask for help. It's very interesting. And it leads us to my final um, episode that I want to refer to in this context. Because in the 20th century, early 20th century, the French school of mathematics was advancing, advancing very rapidly until a point at which they could no longer go any further. And then what happened? Then some Russian mathematician who were a member of a sectarian Russian Orthodox Church. They were involved in a heresy called the worshiping of names. Now, if you ask me what is worshiping of names, I couldn't tell you. But what I could tell you, that those mathematicians who were accused of this heresy were exactly the, the mathematicians that were able to carry the set theory, the mathematics that flew out of that further, much further than anybody else in the world. Thank to what? Thank to some heresy in the Russian Orthodox Church. Is it surprising? In my view, not at all. Well, I will stop here for a time. Being. Thank you. Thank you, Ishuda. And uh, you mentioned Pythagoras and uh, the music harmony and uh, Vadim Rebikov as a geographer travels uh, in, in the north of Russia and also makes videos and uh, uh, music uh, for this video. So I would give the word to Vadim and he will um, tell more about what he does. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gleb. Thank you, team, for your great ideas. Uh, it's very interesting. I hope that I I will later hear and understand your ideas and thank you Yehuda especially for your respect to Russian culture you know Russian culture very well it's, it's great and so first of all I have to say that I am not a geographer I am anthropologist psychologist uh, oh, author of the uh, psychotherapeutic method interactive resonance and I am a musician and I'm a musician and I, and I, I hope that I am create uh, music that I call uh, psychogeographic music I will talk about it as an anthropologist I worked uh, at the Russian Heritage Institute uh, one of the subject of my research is the problem of natural uh, sacred sites. I took a part in solving uh, some legal problems related to uh, natural sacred sites. 
um, uh, because sometimes we unable to protect uh, natural sacred sites using the international uh, convention uh, on heritage because uh, if uh, a place is recognized as a heritage site it means uh, that it must be sensible to to hundreds of tourists and uh, this comes into conflict uh, with the very essence of natural sacred sites uh, and to protect natural sacred sites, we must understand what is it, what is a sacred site, what, what is, it, uh, what is its uh, essence, uh, what is its value, what will be uh, consequences of its uh, destruction. Then I have been involved, involved uh, with colleagues from a UNESCO, Caribbean branch, uh, in the search of uh, a new protection status uh, to natural sacred sites, together with the indigenous peoples from Sierra Nevada, the Santa Marta, Colombia, uh, they we developed uh, the concept of spiritual resource on mankind. And I am trying to find uh, methodological uh, approaches uh, to solve uh, the so-called problem of the seventh uh, criterion of UNESCO. UNESCO has proposed uh, 10 criterions uh, for um, assessing the importance and uh, uh, the value of landscape. Uh, the seven cr uh, criterion of the value of the landscape sounds like this. Uh, the object uh, is a natural phenomena or space, is exceptional natural beauty, and uh, aesthetic importance and no one really uh, understand how to apply this uh, criterion in practice because uh, because beauty is uh, experienced uh, by everyone in a different way moreover one and the same person can uh, uh, express the beauty in different ways today it seems beautiful to him uh, and tomorrow it makes him bored or on, on the contrary, he may suddenly see the beauty in what he previously perceived uh, as something terrible. So I, I try to solve these problems by developing the concept uh, of the symbolic potential of the landscape uh, and the uh, imagined sphere of the landscape, the imagined sphere of the earth, the whole earth. Uh, I think that imagine sphere is uh, of place, is a combination of factors of various regions that uh, supports the connection uh, between consciousness and the deep uh, lives of unconsciousness, archetypal uh, lives of, un uh, of unconsciousness. And imagine sphere of uh, the earth is a network of actors uh, and factors of different uh, regions that uh, provide uh, a connection between consciousness and uh, archetypical levels of, of, of unconsciousness. Um, so, uh, I have to say uh, that uh, that imagosphere it may be seen that the megasphere is a part of the landscape, but in fact the landscape uh, is a part of the megasphere, imaginosphere, rather a combination of visible landscape elements uh, that resonate in uh, the deep layers of unconsciousness is part of the uh, imaginosphere. The imaginosphere is not only a visible, audible and tangible uh, elements of the landscape, it's also physical, maybe physical or chemical uh, fields, and uh, especially it's a result of uh, some um, relationships between the systematic relationships between elements and between the person between who uh, contemplate this landscape and who involved in the landscape as uh, an element of, of it. So uh, I have to say that experience uh, of beauty is not only the result uh, of influences of the observer, 
uh, and it is uh, the result of uh, uh, imagination and uh, the result of um, aesthetic efforts of observer. And uh, uh, as a psychologist, uh, I try to help people with uh, who suffer from different uh, neurotic disorders. And I think that um, I think that uh, that neurotic uh, symptom is a result of a violation, uh, disorganization of eternal communication of, of the person, in the person. First of all, a communication between different lies of a person's uh, mental organization, between consciousness and unconsciousness, between level of the individual, individual unconsciousness and collective unconsciousness, and the level of uh, universal unity, between the cultural determinate level of unconsciousness and the natural determinated conditioned level. So, um, Pavel Florensky, uh, scientists and Christ said that a symbol is a, a something like a channel, some duct uh, to God in uh, human subjectivity. And uh, Edward Edinger said that symptom is destroyed symbol. So we can say that uh, symptom is uh, destroyed channel to God in human uh, subjectivity. So accordingly, uh, I, uh, as a psychologist, I am looking for ways to find the lost symbols or looking for ways to restore uh, the symbols that was uh, destroyed. And I need to exchange symbols between different layers of mental organization of my mental organization and mental organization of my patient. And as, as, a, mus as a musician, I'm trying to convert this experience to music. Uh, and if uh, the music was inspired by, by the experience of contacts with uh, what we called uh, sometimes spirit of the place, I call uh, it this music psychogeography. Uh, sometimes I have uh, the opportunity to take uh, music workstation on the expedition uh, I took with my companions, uh, uh, companions and try to create musical forms that uh, enhance uh, their context with the spirit of the place. I know uh, other musicians from different countries uh, that uh, do the same. For example, Oscar Cortes, my friend from Colombia, uh, Pranjal Yunial from India, Dimitra Mark from Greece, and others. They, they try, they, they, they feel um, the power of, uh, the power of uh, temporal potential of the landscape and they try to, to transfer it uh, into the music. So uh, maybe I want to introduce you some music shapes that was created in Arctic, for example, as Gleb said, it wait a minute, I'll try to, for example, this. It is white seer, it's white seer, for example. And this is uh, um, how uh, this uh, space was experienced by my companions during the Arctic expedition. Do you hear music? Yes. Do you see the image? image? Yes.
This is the way that what you this the idea of describing the lens, the landscape with the sun and that is uh, passed from one person to another, I think is is very uh, interesting. And, um, yes, it's a fine idea. It's lots of lots of anthropologists have written about it. It's just yeah. that Bruce Chapman doesn't write about it very well. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, to to continue um, about the view of, of of the space well from the russian side i would say because obviously the uh, i know a bit the european landscape and it's probably it's the third or maybe the fourth nature already because the natural systems um, uh, were replaced by the ant uh, ant uh, anthropological landscapes uh, mainly maybe the mountains only keep their original shape uh, and uh, what is happening with the vast uh, territories in Russia that they are abandoned and becoming more and more abandoned during, in the modern times. It was interesting that the cosmonaut Sergei Avdiev, we had the discussion with, and also as an architect, I, 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 I understand that when, when there were not a lot of people on the land, architecture was a sort of mark of or sign of we are here. Uh, we're, we're not wild, we're, but at the moment, uh, architecture is becoming a, also a, a matter which is um, alien to the planet. We occupy too much space, but at the same time, we're concentrated in, 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 in the very artificial uh, spaces. So we lose this understanding of cycles of even, I don't know, cosmic cycles. Sun goes and up and down, but we, we live on our own rhythm. Uh, and, uh, so there are people living off grid, I think, in, in parts of North America who, who run their washing machines and other devices through, through a little solar panel that they might have put up next to their house um, or, or perhaps from the flow of a, a, a local stream. And uh, there's a geographer called Philip Benini who studied people living off grid and, and points out how they, they then do pay attention to the weather. So, for example, if, if you've got a load of washing to do in your washing machine, you wait for a sunny day and you see that's there's lots of sun that's going to create electricity with my solar panel so i can use the washing machine for a few hours and it'll be fine yeah or, or they say here's some heavy rain so the rivers rivers running fast now we'll get some power from the yeah. from the little dynamo in the, in, in yeah. the river yeah. so that they're they are relating their everyday activities to mm. to um weather uh, even though they're using what we might regard as modern technology yeah yeah but in a way, this is what um, the, the astronauts and the cosmonauts do on their spaceship because they are also very much linked to the to the solar panels and the the way they rotate around the the Earth and where where, where the solar panels are open to the sun or not. And um, maybe Tim has his own arguments to, to which not contradicts but argues with you. I would argue about the thing about about um, projection. I, I, I think that's a very um, peculiar idea that, um, that societies and cultures project their own um, images of the world upon the nature out there. It, it, it's a bit reminds me of of uh, von Eckskill's um, um, Theories of, of um, Umwelt, uh, where where he says that any animal um, 
pro projects onto an environment uh, a, a set of values um, or tones uh, which are um, the, and, and perceives the environment in terms of those tones uh, in, in, in ways that are useful and important for, for that particular animal because of the way it works and, and that maybe humans uh, do the same. But, but it, it, it's a question of whether we cast our own values on the environment or whether we find values in the environment from the way in which we interact with it. Um, and, and that's the difference between a sort of semiotic theory of perception and the, and the theories of direct perception that come from, from James Gibson, for example, which would say that what we perceive in the, in the environment are its affordances. And the affordances are, are, are what an environment lets us do in the context of our present activity. And the key thing for Gibson is that even if people aren't there, the affordance is still there because there's a world there. And the world itself is, is very structured. It's not something that has no structure until humans come along and put some, some structure on it. And of course, animals live in meaningful environments as well as humans. Well, I don't uh, object to anything that Tim has said. I just think that it is important. And yeah, Gibson, I'm familiar with Gibson. I think Gibson also owes something to Maurice Merleau-Ponty, whom I have studied in great detail. So on the other hand, you know, when I talk about personal knowledge, I'm thinking of Michael Polanyi and Carl Polanyi, Great Transformation. But uh, Carl Polanyi was a scientist who wrote this book called Personal Knowledge. Uh, it was very, Michael Polanyi. Yeah, Michael Polanyi. Very important, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, now, to what extent, you see, I don't think that values are found in nature, as it were, or in the environment. Values are men made uh, precepts and they originate in, in the human condition. You see, in some cultures, some societies, the word nature doesn't exist. For example, in the Old Testament, you would not find the word nature. It didn't exist. The word nature was the, and the concept was rather the invention of uh, the Greek world invented this idea of physics. And they also, you know, if you look at Aristotle's physics, physics and poesis, you find that they are very similar. <laughs> and what is in physics is also in uh, uh, poesis. And what is in poesis is also in physics. So in other words, I think that uh, it will, it's nice for us to think sometimes that what we, uh, the value that we, uh, cultivate and the precepts that we uh, uh, follow have this uh, connection with so-called nature. But I think we forget that nature itself is our, of our own making, uh, largely. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, I mean, there are hundreds of anthropological studies of people who have no concept of nature. And, 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 and we know that, that nature is very much a, has a particular history in, right. in in Western thinking, so we, we, we can we can forget about that. We can forget about nature and still talk about um, a world um, that, that well, and and, and and surely it's a condition of us all um, that that we're in a world. Yes, but the th the thing is that it conditioned us in a very different ways. I mean, obviously, uh, the Egyptian didn't walk uh, as they are depicted in their pictures. Uh, leg by leg and so on. Surely uh, the Chinese landscape doesn't look uh, like the Chinese paintings. Chinese painting depict landscape in the way they, de they do because they uh, have their own kind of world in their mind and that world in their mind is infinitely, in my view, <laughs> more important than what is out there because what is out there is mute in human sense, uh, it is mute. Of course, it's wonderful when there are people in all sorts of fields. But the uh, Chinese painters wouldn't agree with you. The Chinese painters would say that when they're painting, the, the, um, their own apprehension of the trees and the mountains and the lakes and the people 
is getting inside them and affecting the way they see so that then their painting reflects that. So that there's a cycle, it's not just a picture in the head of the painter, which is then projected onto the sure. canvas, because it's happening the other way as well. So, so the painter sees, I mean, Mello Ponti makes this point, the painter sees with eyes that have already taken into their way of seeing their relation to the world that they're in. Yes, but the phenomenological reduction constituted by abstaining from taking for granted what you see. On the contrary, it requires to abstain from such uh, judgment and to suspend the belief in the existence of the world, to suspend your, as it were, culturally given uh, precepts in such a way that you can see things as, as nobody ever saw them before. That's how Meloponti explains exactly. the novelty. Mm. As though you were opening your like eyes on the world for the first time. Mm. Right, as, as if you have, exactly. Mm. So um, what does it take us? It take us, how should I put it? That uh, both sides of the coin are present in a way. Yes, there is a presence of a world around us. And there is a very complex relationship that mediates between us and that world. And this mediation is very much shaped not only by what the world is like, but also by our institution, the way we see each other, the way we see each other in relation to each other and in relation to the world, which are subject to, to the great extent, it's subject to invention, the invention of a particular culture. This is, I think, why the product of different cultures are so different. They're so different, not because the Except world you've is already different. you've already pre-invented the concept of culture in order to facilitate mm. your argument about invention. So so yeah, you've I already mean, culture... taken that people that people belong no, to I mean, the cultures and therefore they 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 uh, think and see things in particular ways. And well in, in anthropology we've got very very suspicious of the concept of culture these days. It it, it it's it's extremely problematic because, because no it, doubt, it, no it, doubt. It, it, there's no doubt, but don't forget that uh, the whole idea of anthropology is a human invention at a certain point. And it's so interesting that anthropology right, was so systematically right. applied to different culture except to one's own culture. Absolutely. <laughs> That's why I'm speaking uh, from anthropology. So, yeah, so anthropology, anthropology is just another, another way in which we impose our, our own pattern on other people, uh, life and uh, whatever. So it's it's very but complicated. It, has, it doesn't, doesn't have to be like that, but it has been like that, that's true. Well, of course, this is part of my point is that nothing has to be as it is. No. Everything <laughs> could be otherwise. Everything could uh, be that's sorry. absolutely that, that for me is absolutely uh, rudimentary, yeah, rudimentary. Yeah. Uh, but the conclusion is different, you see, in, in the, in the history of uh, Russian uh, uh, life of letter, you could say there's this remarkable person that I'm personally very enamored with called Prince Kropotkin. And oh, you see, yes, yes, Prince yes. Kropotkin started his life as a naturalist. He mm -hmm. went to Siberia and he produced the first uh, survey of flora and fauna of Siberia except that he reached conclusion exactly the opposite of Darwin. He thought that species survive not because they are the fittest, but because they enter into what he called mutual aid. I don't know how you say it in Russian. Yes, Well, there you are. Now, this idea had driven him. He, and, uh, Darwin already died. But he did enter into a co communication uh, with his follower. Uh, Huxley was still alive. Huxley was a great follower and supporter of Darwin. And Prince Kropotkin went to London, well, and he participated in a debate, in a debate which obviously, scientifically, he lost. But he made a direct, something Darwin never did, you know, 
the idea of the of the applying Darwinism to society was the idea of other people like Spencer, but not of Darwin. Kropotkin was the opposite. Kropotkin decided that mutatis mutandis, what is true of nature in inverted comma, is also true of human. And therefore, the idea of mutual aid led him to a very uh, basic principle of anarchism of a kind. And he became the most important inspiration for every anarchist everywhere in Europe. And the influence, especially in France, was very great until now. The main kind of trade union insurance and so on is called Ed Mutuel in France after Kopotkin, you know. And it's strange that Kopotkin is not better known and better celebrated. Kopotkin returned to Russia after the revolution and lived for a few years. And in fact, the story is that he wrote to Lenin almost every day to complain about everything. And Lenin admired him, but didn't listen to him. So why did I speak about uh, uh, Kropotkin in that context? Well, first of all, because I love Kropotkin. And secondly, uh, there's also a wonderful, uh, there are two books that are worth reading. One is called S uh, simply a Mutual Aid and the other is Autobiography, very, very beautiful. Uh, and you see, it's so interesting how a man who had all the privileges turned his back to everything and followed his insight. What mm. is the best for human beings to follow? And I think that is really remarkable. But I, um, I, I thought it is appropriate at this junction because he was a naturalist. He was a student of nature. But as I keep, uh, I keep still believing that uh, yes, that we somehow are able to find what we put there. You know, we, we are projecting, we are projecting, projecting, and then what we find is exactly what we, uh, what we have <laughs> originally <laughs> invented ourselves. Yeah. You know what Marx said about Darwin? He said, how far this man had to travel to find the laws of his own society. Yes, yes. And uh, may may I join and uh, return a bit to the uh, to the first drawing of Bruegel that Tim uh, show have shown, because I think that w w this point of view that Bruegel makes it's not from the earth surface but from somewhere from above. And uh, I would like to demonstrate another picture which you would probably know. It's quite famous. It's um, it's this one. It's Aldorfer, uh, the uh, the battle of Alexander Macedonian and uh, Darius, uh, and what what always um, amazes me in this uh, in this picture is that uh, the earth and the uh, is much uh, bigger here than the small people doing something on the surface. So. It, it has the same, in a way, it has the same meaning as the fall of Icarus that Yehuda described. Uh, may I give a word to Anna Gorska, who, uh, and, and Rafi Hey from Pushkin House, uh, who so, helped to organize all, all the events. And uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Tim and uh, Yehuda and Vadim, for joining and uh, having this very interesting uh, polylogue. Great discussion. I've been uh, really frantically Googling all the names of the people who you mentioned that I haven't heard of. Um, but I, I want to just sort of talk back to something that was said at the very beginning about the um, conception of the shape of the world or of the universe um, and how um, sometimes it's a flat surface and sometimes it's a spherical um well sometimes it's a globe and sometimes it's a series of spheres and um they both uh reminded me of two um i guess trends in in understanding the the origins of the world where um there's the chinese um i've written it down it says a hundun is the name is this um idea of the prime, primordial egg um, 
that cracks open and then uh, the world comes out of there. And the same, uh, the same image comes also in Greek, Orphic, um, Orphic, which was a sort of um, sector that followed Dionysus. So not actually entirely um, sort of commonplace, but then in the sort of typical, I think, Greek and Roman conception, this comes from Mesopotamia where it's flat. It's not sort of circular at all. Seeing the world not as a globe, but as a sphere was um, the cosmic microwave background radiation picture where it's a, a composite of photos taken um, out, out towards space, seeing the rebound of the Big Bang, effectively, this um, the sort of background noise that um, rebounds around the universe as a kind of shockwave, but it's completely um, experiential. It doesn't exist as a as a geographic or traversable uh, space. It's it's just one that we have to look back at and um, almost write onto a map ourselves without it being visible or um, physical at all. And that kind of reminded me a lot of this idea that there are um, celestial spheres that we are just sort of looking out at um, in, in sort of concentric concentric spheres. Um, and, and I've got loads of other things <laughs> written down, but I don't think I'll, I'll uh, bother saying them now, but um, I'd like to just say thanks again to, to all, all of our speakers. And I think uh, now Anna will join and say a few words about maybe cosmism and how why why it is related actually to to space. Well, you know, I thought not about the cosmism, but uh, again about Bregel. Uh, I, I I remembered my uh, most loved. Uh, points from Bregel and I remembered in Vienna uh, when this was retrospective great retrospective two years ago or three years ago I fall in love not with big big artworks but with small uh, small sketches from his uh, uh, wafering from his waferings and uh, sketches full of dashes full of plants full of full of uh, some uh, accidental details like dogs like people on some third 73rd 77th plan and i absolutely fall in love with it because uh, this uh, image of the world is exactly like uh, in uh, teams works uh, in uh, in Tsiolkovsky works in Fyodor works as we see it when the world produces itself when uh, there is no man or there is no lab, labor is not only about men, but labor producing power is about everyone and everything. And it's uh, about Bregel and about cosmism, about Bregel as a cosmist. This is the point. And I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely astonished with uh, teams, uh, with uh, his uh, words, with his books and, and with his image itself. Uh, he told uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, today's conversation that uh, he don't know how is to be with the image of the world uh, outdoors, uh, how to percept it. Maybe it's uh, just another image from the internet. But while seeing him, while just watching him, watching him speaking, watching how how he outfits, how he looks like, for me it was a great great experience because I never could imagine how he is in, in picturesque in in his uh, in his outfit. I always read him, but I, I I never ever imagined how he looks like. And in this case, for me, uh, the author of these books, of for example, being alive is team in whole and uh, also of uh, Gleb's ecologies is Gleb in whole with all with all with everything with every book behind him and it's uh, for me it's a great experience of today and it's really cosmic experience <laughs> thank you so much yes thank you Goodbye. Goodbye. thank you very much Bye. Yes. Bye. nice Bye. to meet you Bye. okay
1983 году началась съемка поверхности планеты Венера с помощью радиолокационных средств. До этого поверхность Венеры да, недоступны для наблюдения в оптическом диапазоне, потому что она закрыта непрозрачной атмосферой. Производилась только с помощью спускаемых аппаратов, которые фотографировали близко расположенные от аппаратов элементы поверхности. К этому времени была проведена локационная съемка поверхности Венеры с помощью наземных средств с очень невысоким разрешением. Несколько десятков километров элемента разрешения. Локационная изображение, которое планировалось получить в 1983-1984 годах с помощью советских космических аппаратов Венера 15-16, должно было получить поверхность северного полушария Венеры с разрешением порядка 1-1,5 километров. Эта съемка была произведена с помощью локатора, который был создан в структурах Московского энергетического института. И мне пришлось принять участие в создании, в проектировании и подготовке этого аппарата к полету. По полученным в результате этого космического эксперимента данным был выпущен атлас поверхности Венеры, который вот лежит передо мной. Из карты видно что локационное изображение поверхности Венеры получено в результате наложения полосок поверхности, полученных в результате каждого сеанса. Раз в сутки производился сеанс и сброса информации на Землю, Венера получилась на определенный угол, что позволяло снять еще одну полоску, и при построении они друг к другу были приложены. Вот видно, вот это вот отдельные полоски сеансов. Полученное радиоакционное изображение сравнимо по восприятию с фотографией, полученной, допустим, с космического с самолета или с какого-то другого аппараты на большом расстоянии. Можно посмотреть на отдельные изображения и увидеть, что для восприятия они ну, ничем не отличаются от фотоснимка. Вот, например, наиболее впечатляющим оказалось изображение гор Максвелла и э, структуры... А вот это вот э, карта с оранжевым и зеленым? Это гипсометрическая карта. А гипсометрическая для чего она делалась? Это все для того, чтобы э, дать данные для э, нанесения на э, план настоящей карты поверхности Венеры. Угу. Так, что-то у нас еще здесь есть. Коэффициент отражения. Это коэффициент отражения поверхности. Эти вот планы а, Это геохи, вот отготовилась с точки зрения э, состава. Вот. Это условное обозначение на вот этих вот планах геологоморфологическим картам Венеры. Угу. Здесь равнины. Э, Гладкие, пересеченные, пологие склоны крупных вулканов, гладкие равнины, пояса гряд, горные обрамления плато, венцы и так далее. Ну, то есть, это различные структуры 
поверхности вот на э, тех или иных участках поверхности здесь нанесены. Это было сделано уже после фотосъемки? Это, это все по результатам вот этой самой революционной съемки. Угу. По результатам революционной съемки и высотометрии. Более того, значит, там, поскольку э, некоторые элементы поверхности были сняты с наложением э, в результате после, ну, как бы сказать, через некоторый промежуток времени э, изменения на этих поверхностях привели к выводу о том, что, возможно, мы наблюдаем вулканическую деятельность на поверхности планеты. А фотографии в альбоме были включены разного времени съемки одних и тех же мест? Ну, я вот этого не могу сказать, потому что... Ну, то есть были наиболее четкие фотографии да, использованы, да, да, здесь... те, которые... Это уже дополнительные исследования, которые... Ну, видимо, были сделаны уже после того, как была завершена картография, выпущена этот альбом. Угу. Если это интересно, съемка производится не непосредственно под собой, а с отклонением примерно в 10 градусов от вертикали. И... В результате съемки полярная область оказалась вне зоны съемки. Для того, чтобы закрыть полярную область, были предприняты специальные э, сеансы съемки на э, полярную область. Поскольку она существенно меньше по размерам, чем вся остальная э, область съемки, здесь произошло многократное наложение результатов съемки. И часть э, изображений можно было наблюдать с э, сдвигом по времени чуть не в полгода. Вот в результате наблюдения этих кусков были сделаны такие э, многообещающие выводы, что там возможна вулканическая деятельность. Насколько это... Э, я не специалист, и я могу только лишь говорить о том, что некоторые э, специалисты геохи э, высказывали предположение, что вулканы изливают на поверхность лаву, что мы фиксируем в виде изменения изображения. Спасибо большое. И известный казус, который произошел в этом самом, 12 апреля 1984 -го года. 12 апреля – это известно День космонавтики. Вот в День космонавтики съемка не получилась. Потому что аппарат по неизвестной причине повернулся локатором не на поверхность Венеры, а в предположенную сторону. Почему это произошло, никто не знает. Well, um, thank you for, for uh, sticking around and watching those. I'm going to ask uh, Gleb if he can um, share the, uh, um, the the other video. I'll, I'll mention again that actually that um, uh, long discussion is about half as long as it actually was. Um, there was a lot more that we, we ended up hearing about that just we didn't have time to share today. But um, I think all of it will be eventually on the, um, on the Pushkin House uh, YouTube channel. We've got a few questions. Um, and, yeah, and we've still got, uh, you know, all the, all, the, all the discussion participants, so it might as well be worth um, hearing about these uh, these things in the, in the chat. I'll, um, I'll read out what we've got. So, we've um, got a couple of points from Gleb. First is that in Moscow, the Muscovites ask, answer the question, how far? Uh, in minutes or hours it takes to get somewhere. Um, so that sort of 
supports the the point that a distance is a is a, is a function of the human experience of of the of the landscape. Um, and Robert, uh, who's had to leave early, uh, but has a brilliant question or uh, sort of statement, I suppose, um, which is that his argument with Auden, Auden's poem Master of Arts that he draws a conclusion from an existential affirmative which limits any universal conclusion to a personal opinion. Um, John Ashbury had to agree with me. So his poem is based on a false conclusion, but object-oriented ontology is throwing a different light on this perspective in as much as the object can be read not merely in a phenomenolo phenomenological sense, but from a metaphorical, etc. sense. The chord is still out. Um, not sure I entirely understand everything there, um, or, or agree with him. But I think I guess the point is that um, consensus is uh, is is the means by which we make conclusions about the world more so than uh, our own, you know, positivist uh, um, conclusions about the world. Um, but. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to turn this over to, to Tim and Yehuda, if you have anything more, more sensible than me to say about that. So I'm thinking about the perception of something, some kinds of landscape of different planet. I think the perception are based, uh, the human perception are based on, uh, on something like um, semantic maybe semantic, uh, maybe, uh, sorry, how to be in English, uh, continuum, semantic continuum, maybe semantic or continuum of meanings, of meanings, continuum of meanings, and, uh, um, it, and it based on the level of archetypes. And uh, so it is very interesting for me uh, how, uh, how human, Percept the landscape of different plants. So, very interesting thought. Maybe, uh, I maybe it would be um, we find uh, some something like a key to understand uh, to understand the secret of this perception. How it is uh, how the image of the landscape are creating by our perception are creating in our uh, in, in our conscious. So it is very interesting. I'm thinking about it. And maybe some, maybe some, uh, somebody can um, tell something about it. I think team, 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 maybe uh, some something tell about the perception of uh, landscape of different planets. I want to hear it. Rafi, I think I can show now. Okay, the... brilliant. Yeah, yeah, please, please go for it. Наверное, 
Потому что у меня столько дел. Я лучше буду наблюдать. Готовить. Мне кажется, готовить я смогла в космосе. Мой знакомый, который на самом деле закончил МГУ, то ли философский, то ли филологический факультет, я сейчас не смогу воспроизвести точно, мне кажется, что философский, он пишет философские тексты такие, очень разные обычно, и посты посвящены обычно его текстам, ну или чему-то такому личному. Тут вдруг я увидела запись такого удивительного содержания, посвященного вдруг мечтам о космосе. Мне было 15 или 16 лет. Была теплая осень, вечер. Скорее всего, были осенние каникулы, но я точно не помню. Еще были живы все, и мама, и бабушка. Я стояла в метро Щелковская в очереди на автобус «Экспресс-360» доехать на Чкаловскую, а оттуда с остановки пешком в деревню. У меня это прямо перед глазами. И улица, где я стою, и этот вечер. Может, сфоткать, когда буду там. И стоя в очереди, я читала книгу про Циолковского и космос. Книга, конечно, сгорела. У него недавно сгорела дача, где как раз он с мамой и бабушкой провел свое детство. Тогда, в 1976 77 году, все, весь воздух был проникнут другими планетами, путешествиями в космос и чудесными открытиями. Уже тогда я смутно понимал, что жизни на других планетах нет. Но полет на Марс мне казался недостижимым при моей жизни. Я завидовал будущим поколениям, что они полетят. Причем завидовал искренне. Прямо вот высадятся и увидят, и услышат. Я удивилась, что он читает Сараковского, как бы думал вообще о космосе. И вообще я была поражена тем, что ну, его поколение, ему 60 сейчас, настолько было восхищено и действительно целеустремлено вот отсюда, да, то, о чем вы спрашивали. Мне кажется, что это очень ну, острое переживание для них было. Мы, наверное, сейчас так не чувствуем космос вообще. Мы не можем как бы, увидеть всего этого. Мы очень погружены, видимо, в свое такое индивидуальное, как бы мы не видим большого. Мне кажется, что для поколения тех, кому сейчас 60, это было совершенно Ну, у меня вообще мечта с детства полететь в космос. Вообще, я изначально хотела быть космонавтом. Ну, просто вообще посмотреть, как там это все устроено, ощутить вот эту невесомость. Я бы, если бы было возможно, облетела бы все планеты, потому что очень интересно. Вот. И... Но ненадолго бы улетела, все равно бы обратно бы вернулась, потому что все-таки на Земле хорошо. Спасибо. Спасибо. Спасибо вам огромное. Пожалуйста. Ну, я бы не улетел бы в космос, потому что я считаю, что есть определенные люди с определенной подготовкой, которые ну, мечтали с детства полететь в космос и чтобы познавать новые миры и вот что-то такое. Я бы не улетел бы в космос еще потому, что, чтобы ну, здесь просто мне больше нравится и э, хочу улучшать землю нашу, то есть строить дома, улучшать э, конструкции разные, реконструировать то же самое. Э, я считаю, что полеты в космос они созданы для того, чтобы изучать новое, то есть не только ради ощущений туда полетать, но и узнать новое, узнать о новых каких-то жизнях непланетных и также различные материалы оттуда добывать. Ну, с Земли я вряд ли бы улетела, потому что здесь мне очень интересно жить. Вот. А если говорить о каком-то метафизическом смысле, то каждый из нас, наверное, хотел бы каких-то высот достичь в жизни прикоснуться к чему прекрасному. Ну, вот так примерно. А, ну, я бы, наверное, не отправилась в космос, потому что а, на Земле еще есть столько-столько всего, что тоже можно изведать. Вот. Что для меня космос — это что-то такое очень а, такое далекое, а, в чем тоже есть очень много всяких разных тайн. И, мне кажется, люди, которые туда летят, те, которые немножко такие... А, не от мира сегодня немножко может 
не хват... ну, им все слишком обыденно, и они летят туда за поиском чего-то такого, что даст им ответ на какие-то какие их внутренние вопросы. Вот. И если бы я все-таки отправилась в космос как по каким-то обстоятельствам, я бы, наверное, определяла это для себя как э, что-то такое, э, как поиск чего-то совершенно нового для меня и э, как бы новый взгляд на мир. Скажите, пожалуйста, улетели бы вы с Земли? И если бы вы улетели, то куда бы вы улетели? Как вы представляете себе это место? Зачем бы вы улетели? От чего и к чему? Вот на эти вопросы, зачем и от чего мне куда-то лететь, я бы ответить не смогу, потому что такого ни желания, ни потребности у меня нет. Просто хотя бы потому, что само по себе, мне кажется, делом, если бы брать соотношение приобретаемых возможных выгод и преимуществ, хотя бы в виде впечатлений, и еще более возможных рисков, то в силу особенностей моей натуры, которая к излишним рискам совершенно не склонна, я бы постарался этого просто избежать. Даже если бы мне это предложили в качестве приза, а не то, что предпринимать какие-то усилия для того, чтобы достигнуть этой возможности. Да, я считаю, что мы и так в космосе. Мы каждый день летаем. Вот. И, в принципе, космос, он среди нас. Мы есть один такой большой и многообразный, разнообразный, насыщенный космос. Вот. И, конечно, бы я улетел. Вот. И с, с радостью улетел бы, в первую очередь, наверное, вот в себя, вот проблем каких-то, как и любой человек, улетая в любое место. И космос я бы хотел воспринимать как просто, как остановку как какой-то промежуточный этап в движении дальше. Вот. И точно такой же разнообразный, насыщенный, как и жизнь. Летели же мы с Земли. И если да, то куда бы вы отправились? Что это за место? Зачем вы туда отправились? От чего и к чему? Ну, думаю, что надо заказать Земли для того, чтобы еще потом. Если уж лететь куда-то, то не с целью расстаться со всем, что есть здесь. Только лишь с целью увидеть, что это мое. Well, that was um, a brilliant video, and uh, thanks to Gleb and Anna for, for creating it. It's a sort of um, response to the one that we had a couple of weeks ago, and that you can now see on our on our website um, or on our YouTube, which which asked British people, or mostly British, some some uh, some other people, um, what they would whether they would like to to go to space or not. Um, I think Tim. Do you want to try um, speaking again? I'd still. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Oh, good. That's, that's, <laughs> that's all right. Um, <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I saw there was a sort of very interesting question about, um, you know, the way that we conceptualize um, the, the, I guess, the agreement between people on, on um, what is there? I, yeah, there, there was this. There was this question um, at which you read out, and I can't. For some reason, it's disappeared from the chat now. But ah, um, I'll post it. Um, but um, I couldn't. Actually, I couldn't actually. What I was going to say was that I couldn't make any sense of it. <laughs> I really didn't know what he was. Okay, I'll have a look at it again um, because I don't know what he's talking about. Um, or where object-oriented ontology comes in, 
um, or what phenomenology or metaphor has got to do with it. So I was, so I was, I was perplexed by that question. I have no idea what he's talking about. Fair enough. So was I, to be honest, but I thought maybe I was just being an idiot. Um, I, you know, I actually have something to, to show. Um, and and if, if there are any questions among people in the audience, please do um, put them in. This is just about the last time we'll have a chance to get to them. Um, but I've had up here um, at my desk um, something that I, you know, if you sort of see me looking up to the side a bit, it's because I was thinking about this. And it's been there since I got here at Pushkin House, and I think it's been here for probably quite a long time. Um, but it's this uh, icon. Um, I assume it's probably 19th century. Um, and I was writing down some stuff about it um, actually during the, um, the original discussion, because I thought it was a little bit relevant. Um, but it's, um, as far as I can tell, it's uh, what in Greek would be called a uh, panakranta theotokos. So it's um, an all immaculate mother of God. And in this sort of position, it has um, Mary in the middle, flanked by angels, usually with saints either side and Jesus in the middle. But I think in this case, they aren't saints because they don't have halos. So they're probably some kind of church officials. Um, I don't really know anything specific about this. But um, what's interesting to me, firstly, is that um, I don't think this specific one is uh, um, has like reverse perspective specifically. It has more of a kind of flat perspective, which is a bit more kind of like um, Western uh, Western icons. Um, but um, it has, you know, it doesn't uh, make too much of an of a of an issue about putting things into a sort of Renaissance perspective. Um, so it ties in a little bit with the theme of the exhibition in that sense. But the really interesting thing to me is that the two angels have uh, holding globes or orbs, really, um, and they have wings. And um, it just sort of, and apparently the um, this sort of shape is supposed to show uh, Mary, you know, in enveloping the whole world in her uh, in her grace, um, as uh, and again, it's a, it's not really a um, a scientific view of the world as a globe. It's it's a sort of more abstract conception of it. And um, the, the angels with the orbs just sort of struck a quite a, a poignant or relevant note for me as they're you know holding these symbols of the world while you know being able to fly and they kind of for me represent a bit the um the whole idea of space travel they're interplanetary interworldly beings that um uh, are you know since the very beginning of of you know angels in in our uh, um you know conception of them have been sort of aspirational almost that it's it's been seen as a good thing to be able to fly between worlds. And um, I, I think we're, you know, always aiming for that. And we have been since, you know, before Da Vinci or any others. Um, so it's, uh, you know, just quite a nice way to round off this, this exhibition that's really been about, um, you know, the, the power of us as a species to desire to go above what we can and the, the power of us to, to interrogate how we think about things as well. And um, this and last week's um, discussions have really been great um, examples of that. Um, so I think we, we probably should kind of wrap it up. It's about two hours that we've been here now. And um, thank you all very much for sticking around. I know that quite a few people um, uh, have probably missed it. So it has been recorded and I'll try and clean up all of our um, typos and uh, what's the word? technical glitches that of course had to happen at some point. And it's okay that it's only been the last one that's, that's uh, had these, but um, well, I'll send that out as soon as I can, along with all the other videos, if you haven't seen them. But thank you again to, to all of our participants today, to Tim, Yehuda and Vadim, as well as uh, Anna and Gleb for the videos and to all 
all the people who've been involved with this, especially Gleb, um, Pierre, and Buffy. Um, it's been a real uh, journey. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.